Okay, we're ready to start. Let's see. It's Wednesday. This uh, start of semester is kind of strange. And this is a two-credit class, so we don't see, you know, if you remember me from ANSI 230, we meet four times a week, and gosh, this would be our seventh meeting, and here we are just barely into the third meeting. And uh, <clears throat> we have some more student presentations today. We don't have any puppies in the audience, so it's a little more sad than the last time we were here. Uh, Sometimes we have to get Stella here. I was going to ask you, should I have Kathleen Brandon this morning? I didn't know that it was going to be like relevant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah. told her it could have been relevant because she's brachycephalic, so it's harder to get my human. Carbon monoxide. Who's brachycephalic? Stella's only a little bit. Not bad. Oh, not, not, not bad. Yeah, but she is. <clears throat> okay, so we need to start. I, uh, you know, we're going to continue on with carbon monoxide. I sent out an email that I am recording these things. Hopefully that's not in everybody's way, is it? I mean, because you've you're got two screens and it's not a big profile. <clears throat> but I'm experimenting with it and I've still got a scratchy throat. <clears throat> but um, it's, it's good for me to do this because uh, I've learned how, like the first day of class I had an audio, like a tape recorder playing, and I learned how to mesh a tape recording with some images and then the other day I learned how to, because this has to make different files, it's got a deal where if it gets to four gig, it has to make a new file, or if it hits 30 minutes, it makes a new file, or actually, I think after 30, it stops. So I have to play with it, and um, I had a, like the set last Wednesday it would be, I actually had three files made, because I have to stop it, so it makes a new, it's a, kind of complicated. But I learned the other day how to, like put all those three f movie files together in one and then kind of put it on YouTube. So it's, it's a learning thing. <coughs> it's kind of amazing. Those of you that had me last semester in 345, we did this <clears throat> with student presentations. And there were like 40 people. They did two presentations each. So we had like basically 80 little videos on different topics like surgery and dogs, the K laser. <clears throat> and it's amazing, you know, I don't put anything in Blackboard. No, I used to do the earlier ber version of Blackboard, but, you know, if you have Blackboard, all this stuff, it's, nobody can see it except Purdue students or whatever. Uh, so those 80 videos from last semester, you know, you, if you think, oh, how, would, how many would watch that thing? Do you know it's, they're on close to 3,000 hits on the whole 80, not, you know, everyone is but it's amazing how it works so today I want to talk about this a little bit you know you might say how is this environmental physiology well things out in your environment are uh, part of your environmental physiology and this talks about this is just current this is says the 17th what's today the 18th mm -hmm. so like just yesterday or maybe the day before it happened whenever I read these things I just uh, cry can you imagine the parents and the relatives of this little child that was killed walking to school, walking to the school bus and getting attacked by dogs. It doesn't matter if it's a pit bull mix or... The one thing I liked about it down below, I think they also had another uh, dog, I can't remember if it was some other mix. <coughs> but in the article, I read a couple places, they always have some pictures of the dogs. I want pictures of the irresponsible owner. I don't want to see the dog, I want to see the irresponsible owner. because. Whenever there's two or more dogs, that's a pack of dogs, right? And any of you that know dogs, you can have the, and I'll, I think of my Blackie, the most gentle dog. So one day, a bicycle rider came by, and as soon as the dogs see that, it's a give a chase. You know, it's like a, the stimulus is something running by. The response is, I'm going to chase it. It's a mindless thing, and sometimes you call it instinct. Sometimes it's a modal action pattern. I don't know a whole lot about behavior with the terms, but anyway, Blackie took off <laughs> after this bike rider. Luckily, he was out in the country, and the bike rider 
was way away. But the most gentle dog took after a bike rider, right? And she'd never, she could be here and sit in everybody's lap. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> but there's this mentality. And so, you know, it's amazing, but you should never have two or more dogs running loose any place. So the take home lesson here is in the rest of your life, if you ever live in a neighborhood where there's some dogs that are running around, that's your first warning sign right there that somebody could get hurt. And the smaller you are, the more likely you're gonna get hurt. You know, somebody that's five or six years old, they're right down there at the level of the dogs. So it's critical. And then usually 99.99% .99 of the time, you never run from a dog. Because that's that instinct to give chase. Well, little kids, what are they gonna do? They're gonna run. Maybe they don't even have the state of mind to yell for help, right? If you're in town and if some dogs are after you, you would yell for help and hopefully somebody would hear you. Maybe the little kids wouldn't even think of that, you know. Pretty tragic, terrible, irresponsible owners. I'm a dog lover, but you know, it's crazy, those things happen. <clears throat> so that's one take home les lesson. And then here's another thing, it's a good segue into our presentation today. We're still doing carbon monoxide, you know, last time we met we really, that was our first class. We talked about lung function and the surface area. It's amazing. And today I've got one slide that I will show you that I ran into since the last class to put it all in perspective. But what's the value of you guys listening to stories like this or the stories we'll hear? And I want to make sure you're in the right frame of mind when you hear these stories. And think about when you had a you started a new job, whether it's, I, I'll say, I used to work at a lumber yard, I used to drive lumber truck, I used to work in a restaurant washing dishes, um, all kinds of stuff. Maybe you worked at a vet clinic. The person training you, what do they tell you? Give me, I wanna get us in the frame of mind of why we should listen to all these stories. What, when the person is training you, what's, what should the person do? If like, if you're training somebody, somebody, Tell me what you should do with your training somebody. Uh, tell them to never assume. Never, okay, that's good, never assume, because you know what that does, yeah. <laughs> Makes a ASS out of you and me. Yeah, never assume. But when you're training them, do you tell them, here's your duties? Do you tell them anything about the past? Okay, what do you tell them about the past? Like mistakes that they have made that they've learned from? Yeah. So that you don't make the same mistakes? Right, because you know, that's the value of all this stuff. Right now, if you ever see two or more dogs running around, that's learned from this story. It happens all the time. I remember the first time I came to moved to Indiana, the same thing happened in southern Indiana. Some little girl was leaving grandma's house and was going back home. It was in a rural area, but there were like some houses in the, this area. And grandma's house was here, the parents, the little girl's house was here, but in between was a woman happened to live there and she fed all the stray dogs between the little girl one day was riding bike maybe had done it dozens of times riding from grandma's house back home red uh, rode her bike in front of this house where these stray dogs were they gave chase that day they killed her maybe she had done that every day for whoever but anyway, it's, it's crazy yes was that in your hometown? So that's many, you know, that's before you were alive probably, isn't it? I was really little, yeah. Yeah, okay, you were, yeah. I'll never forget that because it's like, okay, wow, look at this. Was she on a bike, Was it, if I remember? Okay, my memory's pretty good. Yeah, it was like, in a, I, under, I never you know, saw pictures or anything, but it was like, she was riding bike back home or two grandmas, whatever it was, and the woman that lived in between fed these all these stray dogs, okay? And that's crazy. So there's a value of listening to the stories in the past because then you hopefully <clears throat> make it so somebody doesn't repeat the same mistake, right? You learn from your past. Okay, so now I'm going to flip to the PC and I'm not quite ready for my presenters yet. And let's see, let me find the right file here. We're all pretty complicated. Um, remember we talked about detectors and all that stuff. Uh, well here's one I want to start with, and let me do this now with this pointer. Okay, I'm on the screen. 
I ran into this since I last saw you. And remember how we made a big point about why gases are so dangerous? Because you inhale, and that gas is spread over a large surface area. And then things can diffuse into your blood. And it's not, it, it, it has to rely on the big surface area. If it didn't have the big surface area, it wouldn't be that terrible. So here's a little diagram I thought was kind of neat. It shows you the surface area of three parts of the body. It happens to be humans. This little green square is the surface area of your skin. It ends up being about two meters square. You know, something like that, but more than that. This is the surface area of your lungs. When you breathe in a deep breath and how it gets spread out. Many, many times your skin and then I thought this was interesting. This bottom square, or whatever it is, is that a trapezoid? What is that when they're crooked like that? Okay, I'm not sure. Parallelogram? No. Anyway, this is the surface area of your intestines. So it's all about surface area. And you know, as soon as, soon as this surface area gets depleted, whether it's a disease or something, then you have to have an oxygen tank, right, for the human population. If it's too impaired for animals, then the animal dies. But I just thought it was crazy. That's your skin surface area, that's your lungs, and then that's the intestine. So I like that idea. So that's what makes this carbon monoxide so terrible. And here's another thing. Now we're going to start the presentations. And remember, since I'm recording this, I'm not going to try to say too many names, right? All the perverts that are on the internet, I'm not going to give them anything to chew on. If you want to come and talk to me, come on, you know. Uh, this is not my first rodeo, but who, who's, and I don't even remember the slides. So, okay, here it is. I'm going to, you can talk right here, and here's your pointer. Is that okay? Okay, take it away. So, the article that I was given was about a family that were running errands um, just on a normal morning. Um, it was a father, a 17-year-old, and a 3-year-old. And the three-year-old wound up actually passing away from carbon monoxide poisoning. And they found out that it was because of their car. They had an older car. It was like a 2003, I believe. And it didn't have a catalytic converter in it, which is this. Um, the pointer is which one? Yeah, the top button there. All right. There. So this is catalytic converter. Um, it takes your um, like exhaust gas, which has carbon monoxide in it and nitrous oxides, and it converts it to um, water vapor and um, carbon dioxide to be released back. But if you don't have this in your car, the fumes from the engine will build up in the actual cabin of the car, um, and that's what happened. The father and the 17-year-old were admitted to the hospital for poisoning, but they weren't um, obviously as affected as the three-year-old. The three-year-old told his dad at some point that he was feeling um, tired, and he went and laid down in the back seat of the car, and that struck me as a little odd, too, because your three-year-old shouldn't be just like laying in the back of your car probably should have been in a seat or something where he could see him more easily. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, but he wound up getting home and they noticed that he was unconscious and that he had vomit coming from his mouth um, and he wound up passing away. So if you don't have this in your car, um, that's a huge problem. That's why they do emissions testing on cars. They want to make sure that this is actually working properly and taking the exhaust fumes from the engine and converting them into safe gases to be released back into the atmosphere and keeping them out of your car. Um, the reason that the three-year-old was so affected by this was had to do with he was smaller. He had a smaller amount of like... Um, so with his lungs, it took less of the gas to affect all of the surface area on his lungs rather than um, having more surface area to spread out like the father and the 17-year-old did. Um, and I found out that children under the age of five are most commonly affected by non-house fire carbon monoxide poisoning because it takes less volume of the gas to affect them and to um, wind up poisoning them. Okay, questions on that? So it looks like one take home message for your notes is that a catalytic converter takes carbon monoxide and really makes carbon dioxide out of it. Okay? And uh, yes, okay, thank you. Do cars like normally have them in it? Yeah, it has to have it in it, but older cars, sometimes it like gets taken off or they stop working. So that's why they make cars, I think if it's older than 10 years old, they make you do um, emissions testing every year to make sure that this is working properly because they don't want a bunch of gases getting released back in the yeah. atmosphere. Question or comment back here? Yes. Okay. Um, so you didn't kind of mention any high surface area of the lungs that makes gas so poisonous, but then she kind of mentioned how smaller people are using children tend to have a smaller surface area. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about the 
Well, right. They, have, they would have less surface area, but relatively speaking, you know, it still spreads out that thin, you know, a lot of surface area. And they might, they'll have lower blood volume, of course, and so it's maybe a little more toxic for them. You know, they're usually highly, more metabolically active than somebody that's older, too. It can diffuse from the lungs to the blood. Like, it takes less of it to... Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so there may be... I'll say extra susceptible. I mean, everybody is susceptible. Animals. I mean, this is this takes place for animals too. Animals die this way. Uh, so, okay. Other questions, comments. The thing about, thank you. The uh, catalytic converter is often stolen too. Anybody ever had their catalytic converter stolen off their vehicle at home? Okay, that happens sometimes. There's some precious metals in there, and people will steal them. Uh, I've known somebody. A friend of mine that in the morning they went out to their car and they started it up and it sounded like it didn't have a muffler and sometime during the night somebody just slid under the car and cut off their catalytic converter. I don't know if they had a wire saw. I'm not a thief so I don't know if you know what a wire saw is. You can put a wire around and I don't know. Anyway, it's not good. Okay, so let's do the next presentation and oh yeah let me make one little comment about these presentations it's hard to assign them too far in advance because I don't know where we end up today till 20 after so here's for everybody that hasn't done your presentation yet be aware that for Monday I'm gonna probably email three of you by Thursday or something by Friday to say please have a five-minute presentation because it doesn't take long to you know it's not going to be a big subject. It's like this was some articles. This was what happened. But I, I can't really do it too far in advance because I want them kind of centered on what we're doing that day. And it's hard to project what we're going to be doing Monday until the class ends today. Then I'll know where we ended. So be aware. Check your email once in a while. Of course, if you've done one, then you don't have to worry about me doing this. Okay. Let's have this person come up and let's see. I can enlarge that. Maybe. Oh yeah. Let's see. Can I? I'm not sure. Maybe that's okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. That's a little. Okay. Is that a little too far? Or that's okay. I probably won't read it, but was... okay. Okay. So this news article was about a pretty much like a lawsuit. Um, the Best Western had technically killed a couple people due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, it occurred four years ago. Um, an older couple had passed in a hotel room, and then six, week, six weeks later, a little boy had passed in the same room, and the cause of death was um, carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, the mother that was with the child didn't die for the same reasons that she said earlier that the younger boy, for all of those reasons, um, but she laid on the floor unconscious for 14 hours before being found, and she, had, um, she has a bunch of health issues now. Um, multiple parties the hotel management, town employees, and the examiner were at fault for the deaths, but only the management um, pleaded guilty. And prior to the little boy's death, the examiner didn't read the email from the state saying that the older couple had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. So if they would have read that, the little boy would probably still be alive. Um, the source of the carbon monoxide was a faulty conversion of the swimming pool water heater from propane to natural gas. And it was just one level below the room where um, these people were staying. <clears throat> and in court, the daughter of the older couple um, noted what it might have cost to replace this issue, which was just $4,000, but then said, what we have lost is immeasurable. Um, so pretty much the take home lesson is that carbon monoxide at higher concentrations is um, very lethal and you may not even realize what's going on until it's too late. Um, whenever dealing with potential hazards, um, consult with a professional. No amount of money is worth the risk of your life or somebody else's life. And then always have carbon monoxide detectors in your house. Um, some states have regulations, but I don't believe Indiana does about having detectors in their house. Um, and then you can't read that, but I think 15 parts per million is what you said is like the safe. Yeah, it's like, you know, like that level. detector I brought. Yeah. I, I had one. And I don't have any fossil fuels in the house, and I was reading 15 once in a while. Yeah. That's just called background. Yeah. And then once you get to like uh, 15 or 35 to around 800, um, you get dizziness and headaches within two to three hours. 
And then once you reach around 1,600 parts per million, um, you get headaches, tachycardia, which is fast heart rate, um, dizziness, and death within two hours. So it's, it doesn't take a lot for it to be um, extremely lethal. And then at 6,400 parts per million, death in less than 20 minutes, and 12,000 12, parts per million, you're dead within two to three breaths. Okay, anybody have any questions about that? So now, you know, the reason I picked out these examples is it doesn't always have to happen in your house, right? I mean, the first example was a car. This was a hotel. And, you know, I remember this distinctly. The elderly couple were found dead one morning, both of them. Now, that doesn't happen very often. But they, I think initially they thought they died of natural causes, both of them. The chance of that happening, is, you know, that, there should have been some red flags right then. And so then, was it six weeks later, the, they had a little party, the kids were there, and then the boy died. I mean, that's totally negligent. And then it ends up being, I remember the, like you said, the, the, heat, the hot water heater for the pool or something was one floor, floor below them. <clears throat> and then they had run a pipe horizontally to get rid of some gas, you know. And gas doesn't want to go horizontally. Gas wants to go up, you know. So it was kind of fault there. And I think somebody had taped a pipe or anything. But I mean, crazy. But I go back to the couple, the old elderly couple that died. Sometimes, and I, I think it was in a smaller town, these smaller sleepy towns, and I'm not saying anything about bad about things, but you get rusty, right? I mean, uh, like say, let's say a big town, when they have a murder, the people that come and investigate are experts because they do this every week or every day. If you're in a small sleepy town and there's a murder, you're less likely to get it solved. Why? The detectives are so rusty. You know, I'm not saying anything bad about it, but they don't investigate murders very often. Maybe there's a murder in this one town, tiny, tiny once a decade. They're not going to be versed in all the things that can happen, like somebody in a big town that investigates murders every day, you know, right? And you see those on TV and all that stuff that goes on. If you're in a rusty little town, this is probably a rusty little town. The medical examiner said, oh, they're both elderly. It has to be natural causes, you know, not the case. Okay, so I'm going to, I've got to stop this for a second and then I'll start a new film or a new file. So, I'm, okay. Now, last but not least, this, and I'm going to try to get that a little smaller, maybe not, let's see, that's the button right there, that top button there. Okay. Take it away. Okay. Um, my article was titled, Carbon Monoxide Potential Cause Behind Death of Family of Six, so basically, um, there was a family, it was the two adults and then their four kids were found dead inside their house. Um, the last time that someone had contacted them was on like Friday and they were found Sunday. Um, and they think that the cause of death was from carbon monoxide. That was from a generator that they had because they had lost power. And so they had a portable generator running and they think that it just produced so much carbon monoxide that it killed them. Um, and so I just had this up to kind of like remind everyone of what uh how it affects you so basically you like breathe in the carbon monoxide and then it gets down in your lungs and it binds to your red blood cells and it produces carboxyhemoglobin um so it prevents oxygen from binding to the hemoglobin and then um it's a stable complex so it just, it hangs around for a long time and then uh you get <coughs> hypoxia kind of throughout your body and it says the central nervous system, heart, kidneys, and liver are the most susceptible to hypoxia. And so um, that can kind of lead to some of the symptoms that you have with carbon monoxide. Um, and so it's basically, initially, you have headaches, dizziness, confusion, fatigue, and nausea. And then as it gets worse, as either you're exposed to it longer or you have a higher concentration, it leads to unconsciousness, brain damage, and death. Um, so that's that. But uh, they said in the article that the number one cause of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning slash death is faulty furnaces and water heaters. And then the second most common cause is portable generators. That's what the family died of. And then some other common ones are cars, like Alyssa talked about, and then um, portable heaters. 
and then broken pipes, like what might have happened in the uh, hotel. Um, and like Dr. Alrich said, you get carbon monoxide from burning fossil fuels. Um, so anything coal, oil, natural gas is going to cause it. And just like a cool statistic, 34 people in Michigan, which is where this um, accident happened, died in 2013 from carbon monoxide. What? 34, 34 people. 34 in one year. Yes. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, that's a nice little graphic there. Uh, just a couple of points there, and I've got a few more things about carbon monoxide, and we'll go on. But um, do you remember, what did I say about when carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin? How many times stronger does it bind to hemoglobin than oxygen? 200. It has 200 times the affinity. So when carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, it doesn't want to leave. That's one of the problems. And I'm going to show you one of the antidotes. You know, and hopefully you know the definition of an antidote, because whenever you talk about poisons, you'll you want to ask, what's the antidote? And some poisons don't have antidotes. This poison actually does have an antidote, and I'll tell you right now, I'll show you how they administer pure oxygen, because you're just trying to battle off some of the carbon monoxide and any binding sites that are available, you want to get oxygen to the tissue. So, and sometimes under pressure, 100% oxygen under pressure. Anybody know? Well, I'll, I'll get to that for in a minute. Anyway, another thing about carbon monoxide, you know, at a low concentration, they call it mild poisoning. Sometimes you have symptoms that are very similar to the flu. And there are stories where a family would go have a flu for a week, the flu symptoms, and they and this is one actual story. They all went to the physician, and the physician, of course, what's a physician looking for? Pathogens, diseases, right? Are they thinking carbon monoxide? That's one of the last things, probably. So they went to this physician, and they were diagnosed with the flu, and so they, you know, stay home, whatever. The bottom line was their neighbor talked to them when they got home from the physician, and the neighbor was a furnace repairman. And they were telling him, oh, well, we've had this flu for the whole week, and the wife was sicker than anybody else. Well, it ends up being, the guy goes, oh, let me come over and check your furnace. And it was a faulty furnace. And it was carbon monoxide poisoning. And does anybody know why the, the wife was sicker than anybody? She could do laundry down there, but she was a stay-at-home mom. Her exposure to the poison was higher than anybody else because everybody else at eight, 8 in the morning left. The kids went to school and dad went to work. It could be reversed. Mom went to work and dad stayed home. But this, this case was the woman stayed home, and she was exposed to the carbon monoxide all the time. So it was a repairman, a furnace repairman next door that diagnosed their situation, okay? All these kinds of crazy stories. Okay, so now you've alluded to some of the symptoms, and I want to just go through it. i got a couple of graphics of where this stuff comes from, because this is so in important, because, you know, it can happen to animals, it can happen to people, and then I've got some exceptions. Okay, so the last story was they were running a generator in their basement. That happens every year. I cannot understand how anybody, and so here's, I must, I have to assume that these people don't know anything about carbon monoxide and fossil fuels. And I think the situation was a lot of time, and you'll read it, maybe before the semester's over, I'll bring a copy of something that happens that will happen in the future here. But here's the scenario. A family either can't pay their electric bill or the power goes out because of a storm. What are you going to do? If you have a house full, this is an actual story, if you have seven kids that are different ages and they're all crying because it's too cold, the parents are going to go, how do we get heat to this house? I'm going to go down to the hardware store and rent one of those generators and then run an electric uh, heater, right? And so what happens is they'll put these generators sometimes in the basement, which is crazy. What? Gas, lighter in the air, it's going to go through the whole house. Sometimes they put it in an attached garage. That's still bad. There's airflow. You know, it depends on how it goes. 
they'll, um, so the power goes out. The parents need to get heat for the kids, whatever, and then they don't understand how that generator is gonna give you a carbon monoxide. Okay, so here's my deal. Maybe every time a hardware store rents one of those generators, right on the thing, big letters, this generates carbon monoxide poison. Or maybe you get a carbon monoxide detector with the generator when you rent it, right? But nobody ever says anything. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, cars can do it. Even if you have a catalytic converter, you still are making a little bit of carbon monoxide. Yes? If you're exposed to it at some point, but, like, obviously not enough to, like, show symptoms or get poisoned, is it, is it in you, like, forever? Does it, like, does your body, like, fed it up? Oh, you're going to breathe it off. So if you didn't hear the question is, you know, once you breathe some in, is it going to stay there forever? No, you're going to, you know, exhale sooner or later. But here's the interesting thing. I've got a slide, and a lot of, some people don't know this. Do you know everybody in this room right now is generating carbon monoxide? Seems a little weird, but in metabolism, the body, you know, we make carbon dioxide, right? But and I think it was alluded to in one of the previous slides. If you don't get to make carbon dioxide, sometimes it makes carbon <laughs> monoxide. So even in your body, although you're making a lot of carbon dioxide, there's a little bit of carbon monoxide being made. Okay, so anyway, all kinds of places. Oh, and uh, the reason I'm telling you these stories is because, you know, maybe we can lessen it. I know somebody that died because of this one right there. It was a friend of a friend, but I met him. They lived in Colorado. They had a cabin up in the mountains. It's beautiful. Oh my gosh, it's, I, I never was at that cabin. But in the winter, when fall comes, you seal up your cabin. So what they did is they plugged the chimney to the hot water heater. Then they leave for the winter. Him and his girlfriend came back for spring, getting the whole place opened up. Time to go to bed, they go to bed. They forgot that they plugged the chimney for the hot water heater. So let's say it's Sunday morning. Then it's Monday morning, and friends start calling, well, Bill, this, his name wasn't Bill, but Bill's not at work. Wonder what happened. They went up to their cabin to open it. <coughs> so somebody went up to the cabin. They were both dead. They dead. <coughs> Forgot that they had plugged the chimney for the, all the snow that happens. All kinds of things like that. All kind, you know. Okay, so in the, here's one thing. Question. How long would it take to, like, breathe off the carbon? Like, wouldn't that mom feel better, like, if she went grocery shopping or well, something? Well, you'd feel yeah. some, but remember, it's binding 200 times better, uh, tighter than oxygen. So, yeah, it'll help her. But it, you can still, if you're chronically exposed to it, you know, many hours, it's going to take a while. Yes? So if you have, like, mild or moderate poisoning and then, like, you just breathe it, off, breathe it off, are there any lasting effects, like, of it since you were exposed to it? Uh, no, probably not. Okay, the question is, is there any lasting effects? No, because we're all probably exposed to it sometime. You know, like if you're in a, by a car, in a garage, it's all amount of, you know, the death comes where you don't get enough oxygen to your tissue because there's so much of it. I'm going to stop this for one. Okay, so here's one thing that's not here. The house next door. In this drawing, I would put something in here. The house next door may be the source of carbon monoxide for your house. And that happened in England. Somebody lived in the basement, had a bedroom in the basement, and next door they had a faulty furnace. And the airflow was such that this house was sucking air in from outside here, and outside here was right next to where the faulty furnace was exhausting. Somebody died in this basement from carbon monoxide that was produced over here. Okay, another picture. I think the, this gets ad nauseum, but there's that portable generator, even a grill. Some people grill inside their garages. That's always a terrible idea. Never have a grill inside a garage because people have burned their ceilings, you know, when the stuff flares up. Terrible. Loose, broken pipes, all that kind of crazy stuff. Okay, let's keep on going. Okay, so here it is. It's formed when, you know, there's combustion, but the kick, kicker is, tends to be an oxygen-starved area. 
So then instead of making all carbon dioxide, some of the molecules are made into carbon monoxide. Okay, so then <clears throat> here's some facts. Colorless, odorless, tasteless, okay? So we can't detect it, animals can't detect it. That's why you buy these detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. The one I brought in, a, a, so obviously you know I'm paranoid by now at this point. I went on a two week vacation over Christmas and we stayed in a lot of hotels. Do you think I had a carbon monoxide detector with me? Yes. I plugged it in every night. My <laughs> wife and son thought I was crazy, but it's like, okay, I'm reading that dial. You know, I've got, I know too many stories, right? Uh, here it is. Monday, you know, when you're doing this reading, right, you're looking at all these other gases. We're going to make a table on Monday that puts these physical characteristics of it. And carbon monoxide is slightly less dense than air, but it's so close you could almost think of it as density of air. So you know that detector I had? Was it for the ceiling? No, it plugged into a wall thing, right? So it doesn't matter if your detector carbon monoxide is down here, here, up there, wherever. But how about your smoke detectors? They're always up high, right? Because that smoke is a lot less dense than there and it's wants to go up. So whenever you work with gases, you've got to ask, what's the density? Because then that gives you an idea in a static situation, where is it? One of the gases that we talk about Monday is silo gas. Very dense, it stays down. Okay? Okay. Uh, oh, the other names I'm not going to worry about. Okay. Anyway, it's flammable too. It's a flammable gas, carbon monoxide. Okay. Now here's, uh, and some of you have alluded to this in your presentations, but let's do this parts per million so we can remember it. Okay, so there's going to be always some carbon monoxide in the atmosphere, okay? But like 0.1 parts per million, 0 0.1. Okay, average levels in homes, okay? Remember, I said my thing detector was reading 15 sometimes. That may not have been true 15. Whenever you have these detectors, you always ask yourself, what's the lower limit of de detection, right? So those detectors aren't very good at five or 10 or 15 that you plug into the wall, okay? So there's always some background. Okay, uh, so five to 15, you know, buy gas stoves, exhaust from an automobile in Mexico City. I'm not sure if their automobiles have to have a catalytic converter, I don't know, anybody know? I think some countries don't have that law. Uh, so then you've got a lot of carbon monoxide in the atmosphere. Exhaust from a wood, home wood fire, 5,000 parts per million. And then uh, car exhaust without a catalytic converter, there it is, 7,000 parts per million. Okay? Okay, symptoms, and uh, this is kind of a little rehash, but one of the things you should note, at low symptoms, it's very nondescript. You could uh, say you have flu, flu-like symptoms at low levels. And then, of course, it goes on, and then, you know, once it gets high enough concentration, two, three breath, breaths, you're uh, done for. Then, what's another thing here? Okay, so then I looked at this graphic because it talked about, I, I'm not so concerned about the percent here, but look at, no, there's no consequence of something that's low. Slight headache, nausea, that's like flu, isn't it? Uh, dizziness, ache, slight increase in respiratory respiration, all this kind of stuff, sleepy, memory loss, uh, like the kid that was in the car already probably being affected and said, Dad, I want to take a nap in the back seat. Uh, even affects your heart, it can induce a heart attack if you get high enough concentrations. Okay, what else do I got? Okay, so then I like this one because this is from uh, OSHA. And here's a rule. There might be some places that you end up working where there's a high level of uh, carbon monoxide produced by the machines or whatever. And OSHA has this thing, you cannot work in a, in a place that's higher than 50 parts per million in any 80 hour period. If there's, it's a, over 50, you can't be there for you know, in a, any longer than eight hours. So then 200 parts per million, this is in the atmosphere, fatigue, nausea after two, three hours, frontal headache, 
Uh, life threatening after three hours. Of course, there it is. All kinds of stuff. Fatal. Fatal within one or three minutes. Pretty spectacular. Okay. Pathophysiology. That means physiology and what's going wrong with the physiology. Uh, displacement of the oxygen from the hemoglobin. That's the big deal. Carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, 200 times the affinity. And then, here it is, you get this cherry pink discoloration of the skin. And before we leave today, I've got pictures of dead people that show this. It's not fun, but we'll talk about it. Okay, anyway. So, here's a little diagram I, I found that shows the body does produce endogenous carbon monoxide. So there's always some around, okay? Here it is, here's the antidote. <coughs> What's the antidote for carbon monoxide poisoning? A hyperbaric chamber. Whenever you see these, this means it's a con confined area that you can flush with pure oxygen. And this one you can see the person would, legs would be here and their head would be here, they'd be sitting in this completely in there. There's a bigger model because if you are in a big metropolitan area, maybe you need this size. That's a hyperbaric chamber. Anybody know what else you use these chambers for? I mean, carbon monoxide poisoning is one. The University of Tennessee Knoxville has one for horses in their um, equine ICU, and they use it for if um, they have like anaerobic bacteria in any of their like cuts or like surgical incisions or something because it starves the bacteria because they are in flush with oxygen. Right. So here's the other, and you, you just said it, wound healing. Wound healing is another thing you use these big chambers for. Because there's nothing better than oxygen to heal a wound. Okay, and this is under pressure. Okay, here's some uh, autopsy pictures. The cherry red uh, picture, here's the head, person's head, legs are down this way. It's a little blurry, but too bad this screen shows it pretty well. Uh, this person, I'm not sure, is dead or not. It almost looks like they're not, but they might be. But you get this cherry red discoloration of the skin because that carbon monoxide, when it binds to hemoglobin, makes it bright. Okay, there's another picture. I think you got the thing. Uh, that one I'm not going to do. It. Okay, so now... You might say, how is meat related to this? How is meat related to carbon monoxide? Anybody? Isn't it used as like a colorant to make it brighter? Yeah. In your grocery store, the meat that looks bright red has been exposed to carbon monoxide. And I'll, I'll give you the name for it. Like here is before carbon monoxide, here's after. Which one would you buy? So it's called modified atmosphere packaging, where you flush meat with carbon monoxide. <coughs> now, some people will say that's not fair, and it's outlawed in some countries. So here it is, meat treated with carbon monoxide, before, after, okay? And it's used in the United States to make the meat appear fresher, but it's banned in Canada, Japan, Singapore, and the EU. Because it's kind of like making meat maybe look better than it should look, right? And the deal is, in meat, there's not hemoglobin, but what's the molecule in meat that carries oxygen? Myoglobin. And myoglobin binds the carbon monoxide and makes it bright. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Remember, this room is available for the next two hours, whether you want to have a snooze, a snack, talk to us, or whatever. See you guys later.